gastric outlet obstruction, also known as pyloric stenosis. These are the three. Now, apart from them, you know, some electrolyte imbalance and all those things can happen there. Sometimes the peptic culture disease can also complicate into gastric cancer, especially if it is a gastric ulcer case. Duodenal ulcer patient never complicate into, uh, you know, a malignancy. Okay. Now, with this uh, background information, let's enter into the topic proper for today. That is gastric outlet obstruction, GOO, also known as pyloric stenosis. Now, see here. Gastric outlet obstruction is a surgical condition where there is an obstruction at the level of pylorus. Pylorus. And pylorus is the outlet of the stomach. That's why it is known as outlet obstruction. And that is also you know, the reason why it is known as pyloric stenosis. Don't get confused. Now, let's uh, look at the picture here. This is the area we are talking about. Here is the stomach. This is greater curvature of the stomach. Here is the lesser curvature. This is the body of the stomach. Here is the fundic part. And this is the pyloric end. This is called pyloric, you know, sphincter. Okay. Uh, if uh, something wrong occurs in the pyloric sphincter, if it is very narrow, okay, uh, I mean the pyloric canal become very narrow because of some obstruction or some fibrosis or something like that, that is known as pyloric stenosis. In a small babies, we have talked about that hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Remember, that is a completely different type of uh, uh, pathology. Though, though the final outcome is similar, but the pathophysiology of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is very different. Individuals with gastric outlet obstruction will often have a recurrent vomiting of the food that has accumulated in the stomach because uh, food cannot pass distally now, you know, it will be collected in the stomach and then the patient will vomit it out. Very easy to understand. Along with the food, okay, a lot of fluid can also be vomited out. So that patient can have high chance of dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. Dilatation of stomach to accommodate food intake and secretions. This is a natural tendency of any GI organ, isn't it? Especially intestine and stomach or colon. See here, if there is an obstruction, the proximal part from that obstructed area will always become dilated, always. So in this case also, the stomach will become very big in size and there will be visible peristalsis. Stomach also has peristaltic movement. So this peristaltic movement is quite typical here. Listen carefully. The peristaltic movement starts from greater curvature. See this? Okay, it will move like this and going towards okay the right side of the abdomen because this is uh, you know in the epigastric area is slightly on the left hypochondriac side. So throughout the epigastrium, the peristalsis is seen till you know, it is uh, over in the right hypochondriac area. So this is known as visible peristalsis of pyloric stenosis or gastric outlet obstruction. It is also seen in those baby who are having hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. We have talked about that in the previous classes. Now, let's talk about what are the etiology or the causes. Causes can be classified as benign, Okay, and the malignant one. So let's start with the benign. In babies, it is infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. That's what uh, I have been mentioning here, uh, already done before. Duodenal wave, okay, another, uh, you know, congenital sort of problem. There is some membrane like structure in the first part of the duodenum, which also acts like a, you know, obstructed area. And the important one is peptic ulcer disease. Now, in peptic ulcer disease, the stenosis is found in the first part of the duodenum, especially because of duodenal ulcer. Okay, because first part of the duodenum or duodenal cap is the site for duodenal ulcer. Okay, but what is the cause of the obstruction? Now, it can occur in two different situations. In the acute situation, 
there is edema formation and that edematous area will lead to obstruction. Whereas in a chronic situation, a setting, it occurs because of scarring and fibrosis. Isn't it? Because of scarring and fibrosis, what will happen to the lumen? It will become narrow. It will become narrow. And that narrowed lumen will lead to obstruction. So it both setting acute as well as chronic. There may be a chance of gastric outlet obstruction. Having said that, the chronic okay, setting is much more common cause of gastric outlet obstruction than the acute one. Let's move on. Now, the second sort of uh, causes are the malignant one. Now, see here, the malignant causes, okay? Carcinoma of the stomach is the cause there, which is the most common one, carcinoma of the stomach. Commonly, if the carcinoma of the stomach occurs in the antral area, it is pyloric antrum, you know, so it may uh, cause obstruction there. Some rare causes are pancreatic cancer and ampullary cancer or even duodenal cancer, okay, which are not very common causes of uh, obstruction. But nevertheless, you can mention the, uh, these also because they're right there, very near to the you know, uh, pyloric uh, sphincter. Gastric outlet obstruction should be considered malignant until proven otherwise. Now, can you tell me why is this? Though the, the cause of uh, you know, gastric outlet obstruction because of malignancy is less, we always consider this until proven otherwise. What is the meaning of that? Yes, anyone? Sir, uh, it looks like malignancy, sir, and malignancy, the uh, narrow become also, the outlet become. A pyloric uh, set also narrow, maybe that's why. Yeah. It's a type of differential diagnosis sort of a thing because there like, is some like, 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 symptom, it's more considered like, like, uh, converted into malignancy. Uh, the narrowing of the outlet is like, like, the same in the carcinoma as well. So, like, so like, sir, if you uh, treat on the base of carcinoma, and sir, like if uh, uh, further on, if it's not a carcinoma, then we can treat it in the other way, sir. But like I said, the sign and symptom, like for example, sir, outlet obstruction is the same. Okay, now now listen here. Okay, good. That is a you know good uh, you know reason you have given, but the meaning of the question is slightly different here. The meaning of the question is, if a patient comes to me with the features of gastric outlet obstruction, why I think gastric cancer is the first cause, and not the peptic peptic ulcer disease, though gastric cancer is less common than peptic ulcer disease complication. Okay, that is the question. And the answer is because of the severity of the problem. If gastric cancer is there and it has a lead to obstruction, if I cannot diagnose this in time, you know, the patient will die. Patient will die because of complication of malignancy, but patient will not die so easily or so early if it is a complication of peptic ulcer disease. Same type of reason we have spoken in postmenopausal bleeding in case of female, until proven otherwise, endometrial carcinoma is considered as the cause of postmenopausal bleeding. Remember that though that is not the commonest cause of postmenopausal bleeding, the same type of explanation I can give here. If a patient comes to me, that's a relatively older patient, of course, okay, they come to me. With gastric outlet obstruction feature, I should consider gastric carcinoma as the first one until proven otherwise, and I need to do some good investigation to rule it out. Okay, that is the meaning. Let's move on. Now, what are the clinical features of gastric outlet obstruction? Uh, quite an interesting type of topic, this one. First one is vomiting, and this is a recurrent vomiting. Okay, recurrent and profuse type of vomiting because very little amount is going distally. Everything is being collected in the dilated or distended stomach. This is a projectile in nature, uh, means it comes out forcefully. There is no bile in the vomitus because uh, bile, uh, you know, uh, reaches to the intestine only from the second part of the duodenum. 
here the obstruction is right at the pyloric sphincter level so it is free from the bile and uh, the vomitus may contain food eaten one or two days previously because it has been collected there it is not going distally okay so this is a profuse uh, type of vomiting or severe vomiting you can say now what is this vomiting doing to the patient yes what what happens to the patient if there is persistent vomiting what will happen dehydration Dehydration, dehydration, dehydration electrolyte, electrolyte imbalance, 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 imbalance so weight loss, expiration pneumonia. Exactly. See there, many many different points are coming, and all of them are correct. Very good. One is dehydration, dehydration. Second, electrolyte imbalance, electrolyte imbalance. We are going to talk all of these in this class. Okay, this is very important uh, physiological concept you are going to get in today's class. So first is dehydration. Second is electrolyte imbalance. Third is acid-base disorder. This uh, pro prolonged vomiting can lead to metabolic alkalosis. Okay, and another one is malnutrition. Malnutrition because the food is not going distally. It is not uh, getting digested and absorbed. So the person will become weak and malnourished, and then the person can be constipated also because the intestinal content are very less. Nothing is going distally, or very little amount is going distally, you know, and because of dehydration, also constipation is quite common. Let's move on. Now, on examination, what we get? Now, you are a doctor. You are going to examine that patient. So, what are you going to find? The patient may appear dehydrated and wasted. Now, wasted is malnourished. Okay, dehydrated. That may patient may be moderately dehydrated or severely dehydrated. It depends on the situation. Peristalsis can be visible. You see that that's what I was explaining before. This visible peristalsis starts from the left and goes to the right. Okay, and that's why uh, it moves to, from the you know greater curvature side. Greater curvature. Remember the upper part of the greater curvature is slightly towards the left side. And when I follow the greater curvature, ultimately it may reach to the to the right side. Okay, so left to right peristaltic movement, and this peristaltic movement can be very easily seen after test feed. Give something to swallow to the patient. Okay, it can be easily seen. Now distended abdomen can be seen as well as felt. It's usually distended, so it can be seen as well as felt. At the epigastric region, there is this distension, and we guess probably stomach is the cause of that distension there. Another very important type of clinical examination is known as succussion splash. Okay, succussion splash. This succussion splash means okay, we shake the patient's abdomen. Okay, we shake the patient's abdomen, and we hear that splashing sound of the fluid. Which is collected inside the distended stomach. This is known as succussion splash. So this indirectly tells us that there is a obstruction at the pyloric area. The test is not valid if the patient has eaten or drunk fluid within the last three hours, because uh, this is the you know stomach transit time. You know, uh, even in the normal people, uh, it takes about three hours. Uh, for the food to pass distally, so if I have just eaten a large amount of rice and uh, you know had a lot of water, you know, so this type of test may be positive if it is done in me, but it should be done after three hours if the patient has eaten something, or probably a significant amount of time. Patient should not eat something, but still I can hear succussion splash. That means there is an obstruction. Sometimes even a stethoscope can be uh, used to hear the sound. Just shake the patient's abdomen, put the stethoscope on the epigastric area, and you can easily hear the splashing sound. Now, let's move further. So what happens if the patient uh, keep on vomiting? What are the biochemical changes that will occur in the patient's body? Please pay attention. This is very interesting, uh, you know, explanation. 
vomiting of hydrochloric acid and fluid is persistent in case of pyloric stenosis. Okay, this HCL is vomited outside. As a result of that, there is a loss of hydrogen ion and there is, there is loss of chloride ion there. Isn't it? HCL means hydrogen and chloride together. So they are lost on the vomitus. And within a period of time, a hypochloremic alkalosis occur. Now, when a hydrogen ion is lost from the body, the situation is known as alkalosis. And when chloride is lost, it is hypochloremic type. Very easy to understand. Now, kidney will do certain compensation here. Whenever there is alkalotic uh, situation, remember, kidney will try to lose bicarbonate ion so that it will again be shifted towards the normal, isn't it? So there is loss of bicarbonate along with sodium. It is uh, lost as a soda bicarb or sodium bicarbonate. So sodium is also lost here. If we check urine at this time, okay? If we check urine at this time, what we get, see here, there is less or no chloride and there is presence of bicarbonate in the urine, which is known as alkaline urine because bicarbonate is getting lost in the urine here. This is in the initial stage though. In the later stage, okay, uh, the urinary changes will be different. We, we are going to talk about that. At the same time, the patient is uh, having dehydrated because of loss of the fluid. And as a result of dehydration, the hematocrit and blood urea nitrogen will be raised in the blood. So this is because of hemoconcentration, okay? Hemoconcentration, plasma volume will fall, but RBC mass is the same one. And because of this hematocrit will rise, hemoconcentration we say, and urea level is always high in case of dehydrated situation. We all know that, okay? Uh, this is just like a stage of pre-renal failure now. Now, what happened if it is not controlled in time, you know, what are the other biochemical changes occur later? Now, because of the loss of the fluid, okay, and because of the uh, loss of the sodium, now remember, sodium is lost in the urine and fluid is lost because of vomiting it leads to severe dehydration, severe dehydration. And whenever severe dehydration is there, our body will trigger the start of uh, RAA axis, RAA axis, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone axis is activated and aldosterone hormone will show its effect. Now, what is the effect of aldosterone hormone? Look here, it's very nicely written it increases sodium and water reabsorption from the renal tubules, okay? So this is the important point, but when sodium is reabsorbed, potassium is lost in the urine. That is a function of aldosterone, okay? So hypokalemia will occur, hypokalemia because of loss of the potassium. At the same time, there is increased excretion of potassium and hydrogen ion from the renal tubules. This hydrogen ion is also exchanged with sodium, okay? It occurs in the distal convoluted tubules and even the collecting duct. So sodium is, excre uh, sorry, sodium is retained actively inside uh, uh, with the exchange of hydrogen ion. So there is hydrogen ion loss in the urine, which results in acidic urine. This is known as paradoxical acidic urine. The same patient was having alkaline urine before in the early stages, but the same patient is having acidic urine in the later stages because of different type of mechanism. So ultimately, okay, if I combine everything together, we call it hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. That is the end result. Hypokalemic, hypochloremic, Metabolic alkalosis is the result of uh, gastric outlet obstruction. Now, one more point here. This metabolic alkalosis will lead to tetany. Now, what is tetany? Mm. 
Sir, I want to Must explain. Sir, me, I... Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You can uh, quickly yeah, explain. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Sir, tetany, sir, is like the spasm of hand and feet. Is, sir, it is caused by being, uh, mainly by hypoglycemia. And like, sir, in alkalotic al condition, sir, when the blood pH increases, sir, when the blood pH increases, sir, the blood transport proteins such as albumin. And sir, these albumin will bind to the calcium, which will cause hypoglycemia. So this hypoglycemia will cause uh, alkalosis. Uh, so, uh, so, exactly. so it will cause tetany. And so tetany can also be caused by metabolic acidosis as well. Exactly. You are absolutely right. Okay. So uh, always remember this. This is a very important question your teacher will ask. Not only me, any other teacher. Any type of alkalotic environment, whether it is respiratory alkalosis or metabolic alkalosis, the free calcium which is present in our plasma or blood, okay, will be decreased. It will be decreased. This free calcium, you know, will be bound with the uh, calcium transporter there. Means the level of free calcium will decrease. When level of free calcium decreases, the situation is known as tetany. There is a, a excessive spasm of the muscle, okay, like carpopedal spasm. There's tingling and numbness sensation. And these are the different features of tetany. Okay? So this uh, can be a presentation later on. Now, let's move on. To make it easy for you, okay, I have added few more slides here so that, you know, if somebody could not catch my explanation, you know, at this time, they can go through this later on. So see that uh, it is uh, exactly mentioned like this. So let us quickly do it. Dehydration and electrolyte abnormalities okay, occur here. There is increase in blood urea, nitrogen and serum creatinine. Okay, they are the late features of dehydration. We all know that it is known as pre-renal failure. Okay. This is a common finding. Prolonged vomiting causes loss of hydrochloric acid and produces an increase of bicarbonate in the plasma to compensate for the lost chloride. This is known as hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. This mechanism I did not explain before, but uh, simply because of the loss of hydrochloric acid, the alkalotic environment may be there. And at the same time, you know, uh, there is increase in bicarbonate in the plasma to compensate for the lost chloride. Both bicarbonate and chloride are anion. Once one type of anion is decreased in the blood, you know, another type of anion will increase to compensate for it. Because cation and anion should always be in the balance. Remember that. That is the uh, important point here to understand. Bicarbonate is increased to compensate for the loss of chloride because chloride is lost in the vomitus. And that is another reason for metabolic alkalosis. This alkalosis shifts the intracellular potassium to the extracellular compartment. And the serum potassium is increased factitiously in the beginning. Remember, this is occurring in the beginning. Now, uh, I want to take you, uh, you know, to my uh, previous classes, especially in pediatrics uh, during the electrolyte imbalance topic. I clearly told you that alkalosis and acidosis have different type of effect on the potassium homeostasis. Acidosis, okay, acidosis, okay, what acidosis is doing? It will, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, releasing the potassium from the tissue to the blood, whereas alkalosis will move the potassium inside the cell, okay? So this statement, I like to change here actually, okay? So a little bit uh, modification is needed. What is, what is uh, you know, written here? Alkalosis shifts the intracellular potassium to the extracellular compartment. This is opposite of the normal thing. Actually, Alkalosis is shifting the extracellular potassium to the intracellular compartment, okay? Not the opposite way. So please advise you to correct it here. With a continued vomiting, the renal excretion of potassium increases in order to preserve the sodium. This is the compensatory mechanism, and this is uh, held by uh, aldosterone. So what is the effect of aldosterone? Sodium is retained and potassium is excreted. So ultimately, towards the end or uh, towards the complicated case, what happens now? There will be hypokalemia. So the reason for hypokalemia, I can give two important mechanisms. One, 
because of alkalosis potassium is pushed inside the cell so the overall blood potassium is decreased that's the first one the second because of aldosterone potassium is excreted outside that is another important cause of hypokalemia now what is the cause for paradoxically acidic urine okay we already explained this in the beginning bicarbonate is excreted in the urine so urine is alkaline but later on hydrogen ion is excreted in the urine okay uh, this occurs in hypovolemic situation or dehydrated situation so ultimately the final outcome will be hypokalemic hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis with acidic urine now this is the summary of the biochemical changes okay and this is what the take home messages from this lecture uh, in the blood there is hypochloremic alkalosis hypokalemia and there is resuria and hematocrit value i'm sure every student have understood now and in the urine there is less or absence of the chloride initially the urine is alkaline but later on it will become acidic now let's move on to the some other part what the investigation we like to do to confirm the diagnosis of gastric outlet obstruction what investigation now certain radiological test has to be done okay and these are plain x ray of the abdomen we can take and the plain x ray may show distended stomach or the better one would be barium meal okay barium meal this barium meal shows distended stomach with obstruction at the pyloric area here the barium meal showing obstruction at the pylorus the the barium uh, dye you know is not flowing distally so there is obstruction here and look at the distended stomach it is hugely distended this whole uh, you know is a stomach okay and this is the collection of the barium here another uh, investigation is endoscopy with biopsy of the area around the pylorus now let me remind you that statement again until proven otherwise carcinoma of the stomach is considered the cause of gastric outlet obstruction so this is absolutely important type of investigation endoscopy with biopsy okay we have to do that now finally what's the management how uh, we we are going to treat the case remember what this patient is having dehydration and electrolyte imbalance with acid base imbalance as well so we have to correct those biochemical abnormality we have to correct it then only you can think of surgery so rehydration is done with intravenous isotonic saline or normal saline we say with potassium supplementation and normal saline is used here ringer lactate is not used in this case okay if ringer lactate is used uh, then the you know metabolic alkalosis is further aggravated so only normal saline is used here the stomach should be emptied using a wide bore gastric tube this is known as ng tube because uh, it is, it cannot go distal isn't it so what is the way we, we have to aspirate it proximally that is done by ng tube and anti secretory agent initially given intravenously that is a ppi or s2 receptor blocker now what are the specific management specific management means according to the cause if uh, uh, peptic ulcer disease is the cause of gastric outlet obstruction my management would be different if carcinoma of stomach is the cause my management would be different so early cases may settle with conservative treatment especially if it is a edema which is a causing obstruction then only conservative uh, treatment may help endoscopic treatment with balloon dilatation has been practiced and may be most useful in early cases so it is just like a, you know a balloon uh, which is inserted there just like remember the other situation which we have uh, studied before okay when there is some stenosed area when there is some narrowed area 
uh, we can insert catheter it has a balloon at the tip okay uh, or endoscopic uh, you know with the help of endoscope the balloon dilatation can be done severe cases are treated surgically usually with a gastroenterostomy gastroenterostomy means bypass the area of uh, narrowing okay that is known as gastroenterostomy okay now one one small question i like to ask if it is a case of uh, uh, carcinoma of the stomach what management you can do yes because that is my next topic so i'll exclusively you know uh, discuss there it is not included here that's that's why so let me ask how, how you manage a case of carcinoma of the stomach probably we discussed that a little bit before yes Sir, gastro, uh, gastro, uh, in direct ectomy, that part is resected uh, if there is carcinoma. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah. Good, Irfan. Mm. Yes. Yes, Uzair, go on. Sir, it's almost the same because sir, we will resect the, um, the part that is affected, like sir, gastroenterectomy, of course. Sir. Like, sir, like, sir, we simply resect the part and some neighboring part if there is a, a chance of some, 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 some sort of metastasis as well. Exactly. So main, main uh, you know, answer is surgery, okay? You go for surgery. You remove that affected part, definitely. Then you go for some reanastomosis. You have to do reanastomosis. There are different types of reanastomosis there. Bilroth 1, okay? Bilroth 2, RU and Y, all those different types of reanastomosis are there, which are necessary to continue uh, the, you know, GI tract. To maintain the GI tract continuity. So, this is the way uh, gastric outlet obstruction is managed.